Hey there, everybody. It is Monday, November 7th, 2022. Welcome to the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. Try the Subway Series menu, your pick of 12 irresistible subs. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, joined by Michael F. Florio and the specialists, the cast of dozens that help us put this show on. We appreciate all of your hard work each and every day. And we are officially through the first nine weeks of the season. And I figured you'd be feeling good mostly, except the, the Bills kind of face planted. How, how are we feeling about that? Um, I, I give the credit to the Jets. Like, they played very well uh, on both sides of the ball. It was the, J- the Bills' worst game of the year on both sides of the ball. Uh, I, I don't love the Jet fans uh, talking so much and getting <laughs> very ahead of themselves. I, I gave them credit, and my friends were like, oh, we crush And I'm like, oh, it's a regular season game that meant a lot more to one side than the other. Any worries, though, that the Bills' two losses have come in division? Um, No, because... The first one was a weird weather game in Miami where it was super hot. Uh, and yesterday, I give credit, the Jets' defense played very well. The Bills did hold out a bunch of regulars because of that turf there. But I, I more so think this is just like, I'm more worried. if Do the Bills get bored in the middle of the year? Because this <laughs> happened last year as well. Like, they lost to the Jaguars last season, and we all kind of forgot about that. And that is very true, and I do think Buffalo is playing. They're playing for January and yeah. February right now. So I know they want to win all of them, but I don't think they're really stressing out about a loss in early November. We got plenty to talk about on the show today. As always, we'll have our five biggest takeaways for the week. We'll give you some waiver wire targets. And we have a special guest coming on a little bit later. You know him. You love him. You probably rostered him. It is Chargers running back Austin Eckler who will sit down with us for a few minutes. Yeah, very, yeah give him a round of applause for that. Very excited to have him on the show today. But let's start with some fantasy headlines. And this one... But a dude who went kaboom on Sunday, Joe Mixon going off against the Panthers. He accounts for five total touchdowns, four of them on the ground, won a receiving score, 55 fantasy points. Now, coming into the game, Joe Mixon had, what, three touchdowns all season long. Yeah. He puts up five on Sunday. Do you sell high or do you hope this is the start of something good for Joe Mixon? I think both answers are correct. Like, I, I would be fine selling high on Joe Mixon. He had more touchdowns in the first half than he did in the first eight games. Like, it's it's wild. Uh, he's now the RB2 on this season. <laughs> he, he Like, he was someone that we were worried about coming into this past week, and now he's the RB2. But if you could trade him for, say, a McCaffrey or a Henry or one of those high-end elite running backs, sure, I'm okay doing that. But he had already been getting so much volume every week, especially near the goal line, and on this show, Marcus, we've said, like, eventually they're going to turn into touchdowns. I didn't think it would all happen in one <laughs> game, but I think this is a sign of things to come. Like, Joe Mixon isn't going to put up 55 fantasy points every week, but there will be big games and there'll be some down games because of this uh, Bengals offensive line. I will say that, you know, having more than a dozen fantasy leagues, I was fortunate that I think I only ran into him in one league yesterday. Ooh, I ran into him in multiple. Like, I had one. <laughs> in my, my league of record, I faced... Him and Austin Eckler. I was just like, at um, halftime of that game, I texted my friend. I was like, you have eight touchdowns already but by two players, pretty much. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm done. Where I ran into him, I ran into him and Justin Fields together. So, you know, I, I got Ooh. I got to kind of relax on that one a little bit early. I'm like, all right, well, this is a wash, so we'll just move I, on to something else. I but, also did the rare thing. Mm-hmm. I had Joe Mixon in a lineup this week and lost. Oh, yeah, that is rare. I, I, was, I played the only team that scored more points than me. <laughs> That, that kind of hurts uh, a little <laughs> bit when that happens. But very curious to say, I, I will say this. We should bookmark this game, too, for Joe Mixon at the end of the year, wherever he finishes. And when we go back and look at what the 2022 season was for Joe Mixon, let's sort of remember this game very much an outlier into what maybe his season was as a whole. It's, it's one of those things where instead of looking at the total, maybe we look at the week to week for Joe Mixon. In Carolina, the Panthers had been feisty the last couple of weeks with Steve Wilkes as head coach, P.J. Walker at quarterback. We were sort of liking what they were putting together. It all came crashing down against the Cincinnati Bengals to the point that Baker Mayfield replaced P.J. Walker in the loss. Mayfield finishes with 155 passing yards and a pair of touchdowns. I'm not advocating that we're starting Baker Mayfield, just like I didn't advocate that we were starting P.J. Walker. But we did like D.J. Moore a lot more, and we like Terrace Marshall. Is there one of these quarterbacks we prefer to boost the value of the pass catchers in Carolina? Yeah, I think not Baker Mayfield. We also (laughs) saw uh, Sam Darnold elevated. He can now is eligible to return next week as well. So 
this is just a complete mess. And I, I did read one of the uh, a beat reporters article last night just to see like if, if we could get any leaning from this. And it was like, it's going to be hard to go back to PJ Walker. And I'm like, what? I know he had a bad game yesterday. He played terribly, but like, it's easier to go back to Baker Mayfield after that start that you had. I, I don't really get that. I will say though, and yesterday in the one half with Baker Mayfield, DJ Moore and Terrace Marshall each had a 25% target share. They each had 40 or more percent of the air yard share as well. And they each were in targeted in the end zone. So maybe there's good things coming from Baker Mayfield. But part of me is like, how much is that just the game plan that was built around P.J. Walker? I also feel like how much of that was the Bengals being up so big in that mm -hmm. game that they just sort of let off the gas and opened some things up and allowed Mayfield to make some plays. I don't love Baker Mayfield at the quarterback spot for either of these receivers because we've seen how this movie goes, and it is not a good ending for either more, potentially for Terrace Marshall. We've never seen Terrace Marshall with Baker Mayfield, so I don't really know, but it just doesn't seem good either way. Maybe it is hard to go back to P.J. Walker. I don't know. So that means Sam Darnold, come on down. Maybe you're the next starting quarterback for the Carolina <laughs> Panthers. This is where we are in 2022. That gets us to our big takeaways from Sunday. We put together five things that we noticed from the games going on and kind of put our heads together and come up with ways you can maybe action them for fantasy going forward. So the first one, what did you come away with? The easiest one of the, of the day, I would say. Justin Fields, he's a league winner. Like, he's a must-start quarterback. If you picked up Justin Fields the last couple of weeks off the waiver wire, rejoice. Like, there's not many quarterbacks I would comfortably say I, I, I would want over Justin Fields right now. It's like Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, and then it starts being uh, Mahomes maybe, and then it starts being a discussion. Like, he's really been playing that well. At least 47 rushing yards in every game since week three. Uh, over 17 fantasy points in every game since week five, but over 23 in each of his last three. Yesterday was the most rushing yards a quarterback ever ran for in a regular season game. Uh, only Colin Kaepernick has more in a playoff game. Plus, he threw for a career-high three touchdowns. He's looking more comfortable as a, as a passer of the football. I, I, I don't know how you come away from this without feeling anything, but like Justin Fields could win me my league right now. Over the last four weeks, Justin Fields has more rushing yards than Leonard Fournette and Najee Harris have all season long. That's how good wow. he's been running the football. Also becoming more efficient as a passer, about a 63% completion rate over the last five games. Actually going back to week five, I should say. So it is coming together for Justin Fields. I know a lot of folks out there sort of victory lapping and pulling receipts on people who didn't somehow just immediately fall in love with Justin Fields. We can kind of chill on that because let's let's be honest the first couple weeks weren't great there weren't a lot of things to be excited about and there. and let's not act like a lot of people weren't saying like we like fields the talent we hate the way the bears yes. are trying to make him a pocket passer everything changed when the bears started letting justin fields play justin fields game it was less about the player more about the situation but a lot of people seem to be pulling receipts and victory lapping i guess if that makes you feel good go we, on and do that we might have someone here who's going to do that later uh i think so <laughs> i have a feeling there's a guy in this building who's going to be victory lapping about Justin Fields this week let's stay in the NFC North and I will tell you that the Packers are pretty nearly unusable in fantasy we spent all week talking about this Green Bay offense going against the Lions this was about as good a matchup as you could expect for fantasy the Lions were giving up 32 points per game on defense Green Bay scored nine Aaron Rodgers actually had a decent passing game. He had nearly 300 yards, but he also threw three interceptions in that when Green Bay struggled to move the football consistently. Aaron Jones ended up leaving the game, was seen in a walking boot afterwards. X-rays have come back clean, so he should be on the practice field this week. But neither he nor A.J. Dillon could get anything going. Romeo Dobbs left with a high ankle sprain. He could be out four to six weeks. We were already pretty much off Aaron Rodgers because of the way things had gone. But now, Florida, if Aaron Jones isn't getting anything going and they couldn't get it going against the Lions, I don't know what to do with this group now. Yeah, it, it's wild to say, like, the only Packer, I think, outside of Aaron Jones, and, and if he's not getting it done, like you said, it's like Alan Lazard or Bust. And Oof. Like, who Even their defense is disappointing. <laughs> like, it, it's just all it's together. All bad in Green Bay. I guess we're staying in the NFC North. This is a whole NFC North heavy <laughs> segment here. What, what's next for you? Until we see DeAndre Swift in a larger role and back to like his normal role, we cannot trust him for fantasy. And this is the worst kind of situation because Swift is way too good and has way too much upside to drop, but you can't start him right now. So he's just taking a valuable spot on your roster. But 
Yesterday, he played just 16% of the snaps, had two carries, and four targets. Yeah, you love to see that he caught all his targets for 40 yards. That's great. But then you're looking at Jamal Williams, 63% of the snaps, 24 carries. He's the back getting the goal line work. Like, there, there's just not enough opportunity for Swift to have a safe floor. And, and there's not enough opportunity for him really to show that ceiling either. Because unless on one of his six touches, he breaks out like a long touchdown run, what is he going to do? That is the problem. And I thought that maybe because of the matchup, he could maybe hit a home run and it was worth putting him in as a flex. That didn't really work out. But we'll see what happens if he's going to get healthier and be able to, to play a little bit more in the weeks to come. Stay with the running back theme. The Dolphins apparently have two that you can use. We all have loved Raheem Mostert all season long for good reason. He basically supplanted Chase Edmonds in that backfield. I didn't think Jeff Wilson was going to get the kind of workload that he got on Sunday against Chicago and ended up having a really nice game. And so now you wonder whether it's going to be a 50-50 split in the backfield between Wilson and Mostert going forward. But either way, I think both of these guys are usable. Now, if it is going to be a 50-50 split, I think you do have to knock Mostert down just a little bit. But he's still explosive. He can hit a home run pretty, pretty much anytime he touches the ball. But Wilson stepped in there with 72 scrimmage yards, had a touchdown as well. Mostert got in the end zone. Both these guys have home run potential. They have sort of... I guess at this point, what, low-end RB2 upside if they're splitting those opportunities. But it went from one guy in the backfield to two guys, but both of them I think are still kind of valuable right now. And, and especially because I, I know not to get into the whole two a deep ball thing, but, but these <laughs> receivers are winning downfield, which means you have to worry about Waddle and Hill downfield, which opens stuff up near the line of scrimmage. Very much the case there. One last one. one what last takeaway do you have? <sighs> this one hurts me to say, but the Colts – their offense is broken, and they are ruining Michael Pittman Jr. And we learned just before we started recording that uh, the Colts let go of head coach Frank Reich. Jeff Saturday, the first coach that I've ever seen without a single minute of coaching experience, he's going to be the interim head coach moving down the, the way. But Jeff Saturday, Jim Irsay, whoever this plea needs to go out to, can we please go back to Matt Ryan? Like, I, I understand <laughs> Uh, he things weren't going well with him. He was taking a lot of sacks. There was too many turnovers. Sam Ellinger was sacked nine times yesterday and turned the ball over while the Colts scored three points. Yeah, the, the logic is he's more mobile. He can evade the pressure, but he's not. And if he's not going to do it, at least Matt Ryan gets the ball out quickly to Michael Pittman, to Jonathan Taylor, to your playmakers, and the offense didn't look this broken. So, like, the only hope I think right now for the Colts is a switch back to Matt Ryan. They have hired an interim head coach with no head coaching experience. They don't have a play caller. It is all bad in Indianapolis mm -hmm. right now. And for our sake, look, your season, sort of circling the drain. How about you help us out in our fantasy seasons yeah. and go it, back to the quarterback? There's no salvaging this season for the Colts. Like Probably not. It Probably not. Like so why don't you guys help us out? Well, to help us out is a break. We're going to do that. Come back. We'll talk some of the top performers for the week. Also talk about some of the mistakes that were made across fantasy. That's next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Our top performers for week nine, we talked about Justin Fields, 42, almost 43 fantasy points, passed for three touchdowns, ran for one more, plus 178 yards on the ground. Joe Mixon, who just went nuclear against the Panthers, five total touchdowns, 55 fantasy points. Devontae Adams got back on the good foot, even if the Raiders didn't, 10 for a buck 46 and two touchdowns. That was more than 36 and a half. Dallas Goddard back on Thursday night, eight catches for 100 yards, even in a touchdown. That was 24 points. Nick Folk kicked four field goals for 14 points, and the Patriots' defense just dominated the Colts, scoring 24 fantasy points. Let's talk some of these top performers, though. Cordero Patterson didn't make it on the board, but comes back off of injured reserve, gets a huge workload, finds the end zone a couple of times. So I guess Cordero Patterson is back officially now. Yeah, he, he is back. Um, he scored the two touchdowns. The one thing, though, that stood out to me was that Tyler Algier – was really effective as well in this game. And I think that's the one-two punch that Arthur Smith and the Falcons want to have. I'm not sure if Cordero Patterson will uh, will be able to duplicate what he did last year where he was an RB1 and a league winner, but I do think he is a very useful piece for fantasy. And Tyler Algier is like a flex option, I would I say. I think both these guys are going to get opportunities. And they can play on the field at the same time because... As you remember, I mean, Cordell Patterson before last year was a wide receiver, so they can split him out, yeah. put Algier in the backfield, and still have both these guys in the, available in the offense. 
You saw Devontae Adams with the big game, and, and this just felt like a course correction. You know, the week before against New Orleans was bad, just with the one catch for three yards, I believe it was. So we saw him get use early and often. Although I think in the second half, I believe it was just one catch, I think it was. It wasn't a lot in the second half for Devontae Adams. But for our purposes, this was more of the kind of performance we were expecting out of him. Yeah, he played great. But like you said, in the first half, he caught all nine of his targets for 146 yards and two touchdowns. And in the second half, he caught one of his eight targets for no yards. Like, it is concerning a little bit that they have struggled to use him at times this season. But when you have 17 targets, like, yeah, you're going to be fine. Devontae Adams, I think his floor isn't as safe as what it was with Aaron Rodgers because he never had bad games with Aaron Rodgers. And he's had some with Derek Carr, but we know he's a, a guy that you start each and every week. The rest of the pa uh, I almost said Patriots. Raiders, <laughs> pass catchers, not so much. Not so much. We still haven't seen Darren Waller in a few weeks. Mac Hollins has been inconsistent. I know I'm not the first person to come up with this, but Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams, they they miss each other right now. It's like oh. the, the pointing people in the, the painting. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. them too. That's exactly those two. <laughs> uh, Geno Smith continues to do really good things here, and... Uh, he probably won't win the fantasy MVP award, but he should definitely be in the running considering you probably didn't have to spend a draft pick to get him. You probably picked him up off the waiver wire, and he's carried you in a year where quarterback has been so inconsistent. Did it again against the Cardinals, nearly 21 fantasy points. Is he a must start every week? I, I think so, and I was going to say, yeah, he's not going to win the fantasy MVP, but he deserves to be in the discussion. I think he deserves to be in the real-life MVP discussion as well. Like, this is a team that myself and many others – like, I had them pegged to be the number one pick in the draft next season. And here they are in first place by multiple games, nine weeks into the season. Yeah, I, and like next week, I know that they play the Bucs. People might get afraid of that matchup. I, I think he's kind of matchup proof, especially given the state of the quarterback position. The quarterback position has been bad outside of, say, the top four or five guys. Geno Smith has very much worked himself into the conversation of being a solid week in and week out QB1. And, and kudos to you because you were on the Geno Smith hype train well before others. I think. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I thought after a couple weeks, I'm like, this looks like it's sustainable. I will admit I wasn't 100%, but I <laughs> stuck by it. And you were there a out. lot sooner than other it's, people. It's worked out so far. Christian Kirk started the season hot, sort of faded, bounced back a little bit against the Raiders. I feel like this is just him, though, right? He's going to be volatile. He's what a wide receiver, too, at best. But this, he, this was him taking advantage of a good opportunity this week. Yeah, he had over 30% target and air yard share yesterday. And, and I do think this is who he is. Like He's like a volatile wide receiver, too, who will put up wide receiver one number some week and like wide receiver four numbers others. But I really don't think it's a Christian Kirk issue. I think it's just a Trevor Lawrence is still very inconsistent at this point of his career. That's probably what it is. I mean, Lawrence will make some really good throws. He'll do some things that are sort of questionable. But Christian Kirk is still the number one wide receiver there in Jacksonville. So those are the guys who played well. And how about the guys who did not play well? It's time for our biggest disappointments of the week. And who broke your heart in week nine? Evan Ingram. Uh, and I know he's dealing with a back injury right now. And maybe that explains why not one, not two, not three, but four Jaguars tight ends were heavily involved in the passing attack yesterday. Um, but after four straight games of at least six targets and, and at least nine fantasy points, just one catch for eight yards uh, in a very good matchup as well. Like I said, there was multiple Jaguars tight ends that outscored him in fantasy. So this was a reminder like, hey, Evan Ingram, still Evan Ingram. Like he's been better than he's been in the past. I think he's still in play as a streaming option. Uh, but he's going to have weeks like this where he lets you down. Still very volatile. I got another tight end who let us down this week, and it was Tyler Higby. And we've been saying for weeks that the only two pieces in the Rams offense you can trust consistently had been Cooper Cup and Tyler Higby. That might be down to just one now. It may just be the Cooper Cup show for Los Angeles. Higby, zero catches. One target, zero catches, zero yards. It's the whole reason you're seeing me on camera if you're watching the streaming show because <laughs> we don't have any highlights for Tyler Higby from Sunday because he didn't do anything. So, I, I, look, I, I don't know. Does it mean we, do, we, do we bail on Higby now? A tight end is so thin. Can we still have some faith going forward in him? I've seen a lot of people on Twitter – advocating to drop Tyler uh, to Higby and I'm like well you clearly haven't checked the schedule yet because next week they get the Arizona Cardinals who oh. allowed the most 
and literally now this after this past week, it's the most production in every category two tight ends. There it is. So hang on to Tyler Higby at least for one more week because you get the Cardinals coming up next week. That would be a rookie mistake to drop him, <laughs> which means it is time for rookie mistakes presented by Snickers. This is when. We get your mistakes, the things that you did wrong that you send us on Twitter at NFL Fantasy, and we either tell you that you were okay, the process was right, or that it was operator error. So let's start with this one from Dan saying, Devonta Smith and Tyler Boyd instead of Curtis Samuel. Yeah, this was a good process. It just didn't work out for you. Yeah, like I, I have Curtis Samuel in a couple of teams. I loved the production I got yesterday, but admittedly, it was better. Like that was a should be interception ball that Taylor Heineke yes. just like chucked up. And and somehow, not only did he somehow catch this ball, if you're watching the stream, he somehow went untouched into the end zone after that. I don't really know how it happened. It was amazing, but this was the yoloest of all <laughs> YOLO balls from Taylor Heineke, and it just worked out. But everything else about the matchup said that Devonta Smith and Tyler Boyd were the plays there. So I get your frustration. I totally get Randy it. Randy reminded me. The, the safety on that play ran into the referee, yeah. and then that's how it, that's it just led to pure chaos after just that. Just pure chaos. So I understand your frustration, Dan, but you, you made the right decision. All right? Absolutely. Next one up, this one from Better Jordan. DJ Moore over Josh Palmer. Again, I understand the thought process here. I like Josh Palmer, but I like DJ Moore too, so I understand the thought process with this one. Again, it just, just didn't work out for you. It was an all-time bad uh, day for the Panthers, yes. but we, you know, like, it, it, on paper, it made sense to go with DJ Moore. Absolutely, so you don't, don't beat yourself up too much about that one. Next one up, this one from Spencer Pratt. He said, Fields over Herbert. Herbert can ride the bench for the rest <laughs> of the season now. Honestly, if you have Justin Fields, that actually might not be too far from wrong at this point. <laughs> I, I would try to trade Justin Herbert if, if I could there, and, and I would have played Fields over Herbert myself, but I, I can't knock anyone for, for sitting Justin oh, for sitting Fields over Herbert. This, this week with Justin Herbert, the concern was just not having pass catchers. No Mike Williams, no Keenan Allen. Yeah, I, like I said, I liked Josh Palmer, but it is a little bit of a downgrade not having those other guys there. So, yeah, maybe try to trade one of them. You have two Justins. You only need one Justin. One Justin is enough on your roster. Last one from Gavin says, Kyle Pitts over Kate Otten. It's getting harder to defend Kyle Pitts every week. I, I, I'm actually going in the exact opposite direction. I, I'm feeling better about Kyle Pitts today than I have in weeks. Okay. <laughs> he had more air yards yesterday than a tight end has had in any game. He's had at least seven targets in two straight. Like, I know the production wasn't there this past week, but... All we've been clamoring for is consistent usage. If he starts getting that each week, it's going to be better. I hope so. It's just, it's, it's, we're, we're coming up on week 10 and we're still trying to make the case for I, Kyle Pitts. I, it's getting hard. I am not going to make the case that Kyle Pitts is ever going to live up to our pre draft expectations. Yeah, that's not going to happen. But, but in season, Kyle Pitts could be more useful than he gets credit for. I All right, I'll, I'll go with you on that one. He did have a <laughs> long throw that Mariota overthrew him on. He was downfield behind the defense and Mariota just overshot him. That would have completely changed the day if they would have connected. We're going to step away. When we come back, we'll be joined by Chargers star running back Austin Eckler. We'll get his thoughts on kind of what happened in Atlanta on Sunday and just his general feelings about fantasy football. He is one of us. Stay around for that next on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. formation. Eckler takes the handoff. Eckler to the end zone. Bounces. Stays on his feet. Second effort is good. Touchdown Chargers. Herbert rolling to his right. Looking for Eckler. Caught. Touchdown Chargers. Austin Eckler. One on the ground. One through the air. We are excited to be joined now by a man who is a podcaster. He's developing his own app. He is a weightlifter. But more importantly for our purposes, he is the star running back of the Los Angeles Chargers. It is Austin Eckler, the Chargers fresh off a win in Atlanta against the Falcons. And Austin, we appreciate your time. How are you feeling on this Monday? Uh, you know, typical Monday, pretty beat up after a game. Um, but... It's kind of the life that I've chosen, so it is it is what it is. You know, get back to work, get my body right, and then uh, be back to scoring touchdowns this next Sunday. Well, I want to start with uh, all the things you do. I want to let you start with your foundation because you have the Austin Eckler Foundation. And just tell us a little bit about kind of what it is that, that you guys do there and, and kind of what you're hoping to accomplish. Yeah, man, with 
just my journey through life and, you know, just my upcoming, I've really tried to push myself to a limit where I can continue to just go grow and grow and grow and put myself in situations where I can continue to push myself as far as I can. And in the meantime, I've also realized that I've been motivating people um, to do the same for themselves as well. And so that's where I wanted to bring in the foundation um, to basically put resources back in the community that people can use as opportunities to give themselves a chance to get their life started. Um, I'm talking like washers and dryers for schools that have, uh, you know, like lower income families that are living in assisted living or living, you know, in their cars and don't have washers and dryers so they can go to school and get their clothes clean. Um, things like a weight room, things like uh, bags and clothing and other supplies that help that I think most people, not I guess not most people, people in America would seem as like necessities, like you have to have those. Um, and so there's a situation where not because people have made choices to not have them, but because the situation they're in, they haven't had access to that. So that's what the foundation is doing. We're going back and helping people get their life on the right track. And Austin, you're going to help a lot of people win fantasy leagues. We definitely encourage anyone to, you know, maybe take some of your fantasy league winnings and make a donation there. But Austin is not just a fantasy football player. As someone who analyzes the game like we do, what's it feel like to be the fantasy football MVP? Wow. Uh, I would definitely say don't analyze it like you do. Um, not <laughs> so what draws me to fantasy football is the community aspect of fantasy football. I love what it does for the game. I love what it does for our communities. It brings us together, keeps people competitive, keeps, you know, old buddies in touch, things like that. And so that's what really drew me to it. And then just the, the support that I've gotten throughout the years from the fantasy football community is, has been immense. And I love it because I can hang out with the guys and, you know, support the league and actually get to, to know other guys on different teams um, because, you know, that's what fantasy football is. It's it's your team made up of other players from different teams. And and speaking of players on other teams, is you're, you're the MVP right now through nine weeks of the season. Is there anyone in the league that has your eye of like, hey, this guy might be coming for my award? Yeah, man. Uh, who's this running back? Uh, I think it's, it's Walker um, for the Seahawks. <laughs> oh, my God. That guy's a stud. That guy's a stud. I told him after he played us because he ran all over us. And I was like, man, I am I'm a fan. I am a fan. So uh, I would say, yeah, Walker over there at the Seahawks is definitely is coming for it. I mean, Nick Chubb is right there too, right? You know, we're neck and neck for, for that round right now. Um, and then there's some other some other stud running backs that have been doing their thing too. But they got to continue to earn some respect over a couple of years before I put them in that discussion. I wanted to ask you about, about your game yesterday against Atlanta because you guys fell behind early. It was 10 nothing pretty early in that game. You were able to regroup uh, and end up pulling out the win. What was it that you guys talked about on the sidelines to kind of help get, get things turned around yesterday? Uh, man, as long as I've been playing in the league, really, even if you're down, like no one's out. Like you watch games week to week. You can get down. You can get up. Like if you watch the Raider game, you know about that. Like, yesterday they were up 17 to 0. And lost the game. <laughs> and that's the NFL. That's what the NFL is. Like, the NFL is, hey, guys, we've been working. We got to continue to work with regardless of what happens. If we're winning, if we're losing, guess what? We got to go out there and do the best we can to try to get ourselves in a position that we can win. Um, and so, it, like, we're down. It, it really doesn't matter. Like, yeah, it doesn't feel great. But guess what? It doesn't matter if we feel good or feel bad. We got to go out there and try to perform. So that's exactly what we did. And we're able to chip our way back in. Yeah, and talking about never giving up, you had one of the – it was a near but almost one of the mace, most amazing touchdowns that I've ever seen. Uh, and, and you were talking about Kenneth Walker and, and him standing out. Are there any other running backs that catch your eye around the league that you think deserve some more praise right now? I mean, yeah, there's a couple. You know, Brees Hall was in one, um, unfortunately, right? He, um, he didn't have an injury uh, to his knee. Um, Brees, didn't he? Help me out. Yeah. Yeah, he had his knee injury. Um, mm. There's, uh, I think it's Ramondre. Is that his name for the um, mm -hmm. for the Patriots? That's been yep. sticking out. Um, so yeah, just a few stud rookies that have been. I don't think Ramondre is a rookie actually, uh, but just a few young guys that have been really uh, stepping up to their opportunity. So it's been good to see. We we always need a turnover of some new talent, that new ex something new and exciting. Uh, so that's good. So you guys went into yesterday a little bit shorthanded. I know, know Keenan's banged up. Mike Williams banged up a little bit. When you guys get together as a group to sort of game plan for the week, 
what's more important to, to how you put together a game plan? Is it, is it the defense you're facing or is it the personnel that you guys have? How much do you factor all that in? Wow, that's a great question. Um, there's a little bit of both. A um, little bit of both. I would say you try to put the players that you have in a position that you think they'll have the most success based off of the defense that you're going to be expecting to see. It doesn't mean you're always going to see that um, defense. And a lot of times there's times where you're like, oh, we weren't planned for this. And so we have to adjust on the run. Um, and I would say for the most part, it is your personnel is the heaviest factor that plays into that. And your personnel allows you to open up your playbook even more if you have guys that can do multiple things. And, you know, right now we have guys banged up. So we have guys that are having to step up and, and you know, take take a role that has been a little maybe a little bit bigger than they had before. But, you know, that's what is also great about the NFL is now you get a chance. That's how I'm here sitting here talking to you today is because I had a chance. Uh, I took advantage of an opportunity and now here I am. Um, you know, leading it, leading the way for the running backs of fantasy. <laughs> and and as we were talking about earlier, we're always breaking down this game every week. And in fantasy, one big thing is trying to find like new trends in an offense to be on a player before other people are. Um, but often it's just like a case of it was just being one big game. Is there any tips as someone who watches film way more closely than the rest of us to identifying what's just a, a one game thing and maybe what might be something that can stick? Yeah, I think it comes down to, you know, who did maybe that person, maybe that popped off, who do they play? Uh, I think, you know, there's, for instance, um, Joe Mixon had like 55 fantasy points. <laughs> it's like when you have scenarios like that, it's like, okay, like maybe there's some talent there, but let's take a deeper look. Who are they playing? Um, what was the scenario as far as the defense? How do they struggle against the run type of thing? Um you know, even if you look at our defense, I feel like we've been struggling against the run for the past couple of weeks, right? And so the running backs that are coming up against us are having these huge games. Um, and so, like, all that takes, you know, takes into account whether you're going to pick up a guy. But, I mean, at this point in the season, if, if you have anyone that's popping off, you probably should pick him up because, you know, usually everyone's picked up by now. Um, so if anyone pops off, definitely snag him if they're still available. <laughs> that would be my two. Yep. <laughs> uh, Austin, I know you take care of yourself. I know this is a recovery day for you, as you mentioned. I also know that you went to the coaches when the schedule expanded to 17 games to sort of try to figure out that balance to make sure that you were going to be fresh come the end of the season. I also know a lot of running backs want to get touches. They want to get in that rhythm. How do you find that balance between getting enough opportunities so that you're, you're in a rhythm without making sure you're going to get overworked over the course of a season? Yeah, you know, it, it comes down to, to balance, right? And balance of longevity and balance of, you know, short-term impact on the team. And so I want to make sure I'm making the biggest impact on the team as I can um, and making sure I'm being efficient and able to be fresh. Well, that means being available for the entire season usually. Um, so you, you do want to have some, some sort of, I guess, counterpart that can also take some load off you that can also continue to have um, a high level of play, right? Because that's going to you know, be able to, sh that's going to allow us to be able to share workload. It doesn't mean I'm going to be less efficient. Hopefully it means I'm going to be more efficient. You might have a fewer touches, but like I said, the longevity of it, right? Playing in week 18 is the benefit that hopefully you're trying to you know, come out with that. And so there's a lot of different things that can happen, scenarios where you have injuries where it's like, Austin, that's just not the scenario right now. You got to play, you know, pretty much, you know, as much as you can. Um, and, you know, you kind of just roll with the punches. Ideally, I would like to have someone that, yeah, is able to get out there and continue to t basically half and half because um, I know how that feels. And you can still have success like that as a running back, but then also feel really good after games. Austin, next week is a great running back matchup between you, the RB1 in fantasy, and one of the players trying to catch you in Christian McCaffrey. Uh, but the only thing that McCaffrey has on you this year is – He's thrown a passing touchdown. So uh, do you have to hmm. warm up your shoulder? Can we expect to see you throwing some passes anytime soon? Uh, you know, I don't want to give away too much of the playbook. So uh, you know. <laughs> I'm not saying it can't happen. It's just really. <laughs> Well, it's funny because how, how much how you talk about balance, right? Balance in terms of like, you know, preparing yourself and keeping your body fresh. How important is balance in an offense? You know, throwing the ball versus running the ball. Maybe it's not 50 50, but, but where do you guys find a good balance in terms of, of mixing up your play calling? Uh, you find a good balance in what's success. You know, it's not necessarily that we're trying to have balance running and passing. It, we're just trying to have balance in whatever we're having success in, continuing to do that. Um, and for the most part, that has looked like football 
league having pass and run. But for some teams, it's like, hey, we can pass the ball a bunch, and that gives us a good balance. Our balance is a little bit different than other teams, right? Like, it depends on the personnel. It depends on, you know, who you have, how how guys are playing. Um, and so, you know, for instance, you know, if you look at the, you know, the Titans, you know, in that game, like, Derrick Henry, you got to get it going, man. Like, like he's their guy, right? He's going to make plays for them. So their balance is a lot different than, you know, their counterparts who they played, you know, just this last Sunday, Patrick Holmes, we threw like 65 times, right? So <laughs> the balance is always different depending on the team. Um, and luckily for me, I can run and catch the ball. Um, so, you know, I'll fit into to any scenario and be able to make plays wherever you need me to. And, and as fantasy players, we all have, like, horror stories. Like, if you played Joe Mixon this week, you probably lost. So I, I'm wondering, have you ever lost a fantasy matchup because you went against yourself? Yeah, all the time. I have six different <laughs> I, I all the time. Good. Uh, what sort of things do you want to do? Like, we, we hope you, you play for a long time and have a lot of success, and we appreciate your time. But when, when your playing career is eventually over, what sort of things uh, are you going to occupy your time with? Man, wow. So this is something that I'm, like, very passionate about. Um, and really, it's the same things that I'm doing now, um, which is really putting myself in, putting myself in opportunity, opportunities to grow, right? That's why I have the app. That's why I have the foundation. You know, I have my different podcasts with Yahoo, with Twitch. Um, and then, you know, just oh, I have a real estate fund. Um, and then just me learning my education, my network. So I'll continue to expand in those different avenues because I think that's what really gives you in life is when you're able to continue to bring value to your own life and then also apply that value in other aspects of your life. Um, and so for me, I'm just going to continue to fill my life with that and try to do as much as I can and try to make as big of an impact as people's lives as they can to show that even the things that I'm doing, even though I've you know, started a lot earlier maybe than some other people, um, they're not hard. It's not that I'm doing anything spectacular as far as my talent or anything like that. It's really coming down to me working and being consistent in my work. Um, and guess what? I continue to pay off. It might pay off a little bit faster or slower than some other people, but guess what? It's going to have some type of progress in your life. And so if I can help people realize that and realize people re help people realize that it's really just a commitment to some type of journey that can put you on a path to have some type of fulfillment in your life, then guess what? You should probably go down that because it's going to lead to some type of life that you never even imagined for yourself. Like myself here, I never was even going to think about playing in the NFL. And now I'm here and now I'm growing on top of it. So that's what I'll be doing when I'm done playing. Well, we certainly uh, appreciate the work you're doing off the field. We're excited and we enjoy watch watching the work you do on the field. And we're certainly grateful you took some time for us today. Uh, you can check out Austin Eckler, of course, on Eckler's Edge with our good friend Matt Harmon on the Yahoo Fantasy Football Forecast podcast. So, again, we thank you for the time, Austin, and uh, continue the success. Best of luck for the rest of the season. I appreciate it, boys. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thank you again for joining the show. Stick around. We got more coming up. Let's top waiver wire picks after the break on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. It's time for Refresh Your Lineup presented by Subway. Looking at the top waiver wire targets for week 10. Florio, walk us through who you have. Marcus Mariota, who I know played poorly in week nine, but runs a lot, and he has a great matchup who he just went off against a couple weeks ago in the Panthers. Daniel Jones in, in a matchup against the Houston Texans. And then Deshaun Watson, because I know we're a couple weeks away, but he can return shortly. So if you need a quarterback, grab him. Jeff Wilson Jr., Rashad White, Cam Akers. Jeff Wilson Jr., really the only name to go too heavy on there at the running back position. And then some receivers. Uh, George Pickens, who was dropped in a good amount of leagues because of the bye week. Get him on your roster now with no Chase Claypool there. Rondell Moore continues to be heavily involved with no Marquise Brown. Terrace Marshall Jr. Uh, continues to be heavily involved there. Julio Jones is back and healthy. Odell Beckham Jr., just because he's getting cleared this week, could be signed and back in our lives soon. Samore Torre, just because Romeo Dobbs uh, left due to injury. And then some tight ends. Cole Komet, Kate Otten, and Greg Dolchik, just uh, don't want, don't forget about Greggy D there after the bye last week. Yeah, Greg Dolchik, who stepped in and has immediately had a pretty large workload, a uh, big role there in the, in Denver. So uh, definitely keep him in mind if you need some tight end help, which pretty much most of us do. If you want more in depth analysis on some of these waiver wire picks, be sure to check out Matt Okada's weekly waiver wire column. You can find that 
at NFL.com slash waiver wire. There are four teams on a bye this week, the Ravens, Bengals, Patriots, and Jets. So you're going to be missing certainly a couple of key quarterbacks, probably some running backs as well heading into week 10. But let's talk about some of the guys that we have on this list. Jeff Wilson, talked about him at the top of the show. The, the Dolphins do have two solid running backs now in Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson. Knowing that it could be a 50-50 split, how confident are you in, in maybe starting Wilson, say, as a flex on a weekly basis? I think it would depend on the matchup. Like, the, the Bears are a team that you can run all over. We know that they have struggled against the run. So that, that was a favorable spot for them. Uh, next week, the Dolphins, they, they have another favorable matchup, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, oh, the Browns. They're a defense that you can run yeah. all over. We know that. So, like, in a matchup like that, I, I think they're in play. Like, the week they play the Patriots, I might, uh, I might get away from the running backs a little bit. But... What stood out to me was in his first game, he literally had to get a private plane last week to fly him to, to Florida because it was in the middle of the week. Uh, he played more snaps, had the same number of carries, and had an extra target than Raheem Mostert did. I know one of the things he said was that everything was pretty much the same. I think they have tweaked a little bit of the terminology, some of the, the wording they use there in Miami versus San Francisco, but everything was the same. So there really was no learning curve. He could jump right in and handle the offense, which is why you saw him get as much work as he did. I would also say, you know, look, if you are in a 10-team league, you're not flexing Jeff Wilson. But deeper leagues, bigger leagues, I do think he has the the ability, the ceiling, or maybe the floor, either way, to, to get into your lineup. Terrace Marshall Jr., it was not a great day for him on Sunday. It was not a great day for the Panthers in general. But the usage continues to be what we want, so I guess it's worth still starting him. Yeah, six targets yesterday was a team high. He led them with 53 receiving yards. He also caught a touchdown. But what stands out to me is last week he had three end zone targets. This week he had two. Uh, both came from Baker Mayfield in the second half, as did his touchdown. And then um, that's five end zone targets in the last two weeks. Uh, to put that into perspective, DJ Moore leads, is tied for the team lead with five all season. And I think behind him, it's like one person has another end zone target. So, like, they are funneling this offense in the red zone through Terrace Marshall. And to me, that, that's enough to make him a top receiver pickup this Well, week. and he's starting to look like the guy we thought had sleeper potential last year. He just never could consistently be on the field. So now it's starting to come together for him midway through this season. Cole Komet was a guy that we liked as a sleeper coming into the year at tight end and sort of like the rest of the Bears offense. The early part of the season, not so great. Last couple of weeks, though, Komet's starting to come to life as Justin Fields starts to get more efficient. So maybe we're adding one more tight end to the pot right now. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and seeing him catch his first touchdown last week since 2020 and then follow it up with two this week, you have to be feeling very encouraged. And uh, that, like... Spoiler alert, he's going to be a start in this week's Stardom Cinema article uh, because of the matchup against the Lions and stuff. But not only is it a good matchup, like we're talking about a guy who is ascending in a, in a red hot offense right now, who's getting more and more work each week and who's not leaving the field. And then he's a tight end. Like, that's enough right there to pick him up. Definitely. The fact that he's getting in the end zone is a big, big plus for Cole Komet. So if the target share stays there, even in a low volume passing offense, I think we can start to trust Cole Komet a little bit. Deshaun Watson is still suspended. He's expected to return in week 13, December 4th, against the Houston Texans. So still a few weeks away from him playing. But, Florida, we have seen his roster ship percentage go up. And at a time when we need quarterbacks, Deshaun Watson, I mean, look, we know what he can be, what he has been in this league on the field as a player. Uh, it, it just seems like this is a guy who is too talented to leave out there on the waiver wire. And look, I don't know how quickly he gets back into things, but he does have the potential to really help out a lot of fantasy rosters. Yeah, I was shocked yesterday when I checked the uh, the rostered percentage and saw that it was over 40%. And, and that means people are planning ahead and saying, hey, I quarterback is a wasteland for many teams this year. So if, especially if you were the team riding with like a Brady or a Rodgers or a Stafford or any of the many disappointing quarterbacks, you want this guy on your roster because like Marcus said, we don't know what he's going to be when he comes back. There could be a lot of rust to shake off, but we know the upside is that this guy's top five, maybe even top three uh, fan excuse me, fantasy quarterback. And then the schedule, like he returns against the Texans, then he gets the Bengals, Ravens, Saints, Commanders. Like, not a whole lot of really tough matchups in that in that five-game span that's scary. 
And look, even if he's rusty throwing the football, we know he still has that rushing upside. We've talked mm -hmm. about it. I mean, it's part of the reason we've been so big on Justin Fields. Even if he's not throwing it effectively, he's running it effectively, and that is a thing that Deshaun Watson brings to the table. We are almost done here. We'll come back, and we will give you our Madden movers, the guys who deserve a little bit of a boost, our chance to give some love to guys who haven't otherwise made the show. That's coming up on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Time for another edition of Madden Movers, where we talk about some guys who maybe deserve a little bit of a bump in their Madden rating based on what they did in week nine. So think of it as a way to give some love to some guys we otherwise weren't able to get into the show today. So for you, who's the first guy who deserves a little bit of love this week? A player that I didn't anticipate being like a huge supporter of coming into the year, but to a tongue of Iloa because he just deserves a lot of credit. Like he's playing great football right now and yeah the throw downfield to Jalen Waddle was a little underthrown but uh he still has, is getting the most out of his receivers Tyreek Hill is on pace to be the first ever 2,000 yard receiver and he is surgical when it comes to passes in in the intermediate zone which is 10 to 19 air yards like I've never seen someone put the ball so quickly such on like yeah, these guys are so fast, and he gets the ball. Like it, It's just so effortlessly the way he just gets them the ball and, and allows them to do their thing after the catch. When I saw the deep ball to Jalen Waddle, I did think about you. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, he's not the best deep ball thrower. I've never said he is, but he can get the job done. No, knowing how Twitter was letting you have it <laughs> about to his deep ball, when I saw that, I was like, oh, Florio's mentions, RIP. I'll take it. I, I got Kate Otten, who deserves a little bit of a bump. He's a 67 overall. Maybe he needs a little bit more than that. He had what was the game-winning touchdown on Sunday against the Rams. But more than that, he's actually starting to earn the trust of Tom Brady. And, yes, he's not going to replace Rob Gronkowski. Nobody is saying that. But we do know that Brady likes throwing to his tight ends. It was Gronk. It was Cameron Braith at times. And now it looks like it's going to be Cade Otten, especially for an offense that's struggling to move the ball consistently. Maybe having that tight end option in the middle of the field, those intermediate depths will help open some things up for guys like Chris Godwin and Mike Evans and even Julio Jones as well. But he's starting to get more looks, get more touches, get in the end zone. So I think Cade Otten deserves a little bit of extra love from the folks over at EA. Uh, next one, who else deserves a bit of a boost? Travis Etienne, who is an 81 overall, and he's something like the 20-something best, or maybe it's just like just inside the top 20 running backs in Madden. But ask fantasy managers. There's not 15, there's not 10 running backs right now in the NFL better than Travis Etienne. Since they traded James Robinson, he's eclipsed 120 yards in both games, over 25 fantasy points in both games, and three touchdowns in the last two games combined. He can get the job done on the ground. He can get the job done through the, the passing game. He, there's nothing he can't do. Well, and now with James Robinson there, it is really his backfield. Jamichael Hasty, not really a threat to get a significant number of touches. Travis Etienne looking like a legit potential league winner for a lot of fantasy teams. Noah Fant deserves a little bit of love. Yesterday morning on one of my rosters, I was stuck trying to choose between Will Disley and Noah Fant. Uh, Adam Rank had loved Will Disley. Florio had loved Noah Fant. I picked Fant. I feel yeah. good about it. Not five for 96 yards. That was a good choice. But more than that, and you pointed this out, Mike, that Fant is actually playing more snaps. He's getting more of the looks in the passing game right now. We talk about how great Geno Smith has been, and now they're starting to diversify. It's not just a DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett passing game. More guys are getting involved and Noah Fant starting to blossom. I mean, he's maybe not going to be the high-end guy when he, that we thought he was coming out of college, but starting to be a little bit more consistent, and that's what we love. And uh, we're just, Again, anytime we get a tight end who looks consistent and is playing well, I'm happy for it, although I feel like every time we get too excited about that guy, he also disappears. Oh, yeah. And I, I do like the storyline you're setting up here, Marcus. Your, your two Madden movers are both tight ends who are going to be facing each other head-to-head -head yeah. in Germany next week. Only one can leave, though. Oh, <laughs> two men enter, <laughs> one man leaves. You know what? This was a, 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 an inadvertent promo for the NFL game in Munich coming up this week. So, yeah, check that out on NFL Network and NFL Plus, uh, 9.30 a.m. Eastern, 6.30 a.m. Pacific. All right. You know, the story always goes – if you subscribe to one of these shows, then you get all of them in your podcast feed. So that means you can subscribe to this show on Mondays and Wednesdays. You can do the Q&A show on Tuesdays and Fridays. Or you can uh, subscribe to the Stardom Sidham show on Thursdays. You can also watch all of these shows five days a week in the NFL Fantasy app, the NFL Fast Channels, and at YouTube.com slash NFL Fantasy Football.
In the meantime, for us, that is it. We are done. Big thank you to Austin Eckler for stopping by and hanging out with us today. We appreciate the rest of you, of course, hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. Try the Subway Series menu, your pick of 12 irresistible subs. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, you know you're getting old when you're warned to slow down by your doctor, not by the cops. Be safe, take care of yourselves, and we will talk to you on Wednesday.